Hello, good morning and, and for the last day, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, last day of this virtual training. So today we have a very intense day because we need to cover quite a lot of presentations. So we will start the day with introducing the two SDG 241 questionnaires, meaning uh, as Fandiar will present the data collection tool. So the survey question and the alternative data sources. And then I will present the FOS DG241 data collection questionnaire. Then we move to the results of the first 2020 dispatch. And finally, the last two presentations will be dedicated to the short, medium, and long-term expectations. And then we give the floor to Statistics Indonesia that will share their experience in the data collection process uh, the overall challenges and the lesson learned. I'm sure that it will be a very interesting session for all participants. And then we close the meeting with an open discussion where each country will expose their challenges in the data collection and reporting on the two for one and the action plan to overcome them. So we are looking forward to for this discussion because listening your experience will help us understanding better the situation and uh, eventually assist you in the data collection and reporting on two for one. Uh, in this session, we will cover in detail the data collection tools that have been developed by FAO to support countries and member states in their data collection and reporting efforts on SDG 2.4.1. Um, as highlighted, uh, you know, over, over the course of the past three days, the focus of SDG 241 is to assess the sustainability of agriculture holdings and its agricultural land area. And thus, farm surveys um, offered an opportunity for collecting data through a single instrument for indicator 2.4.1. Uh, this decision to use farm survey um, was in line with country efforts supported by FAO to develop farm surveys or agriculture surveys as the most appropriate tool for generating agriculture statistics. The choice of uh, farm survey was made because of the following reasons. Okay, So there were some underlying justifications based on which we decided that farm survey is the, is the most suitable tool for us to collect information on SCG 241. Farm survey does exist in countries in one shape or form or another to collect data on different aspects of agriculture sector for various reasons, right? So every country may have some kind of agriculture survey already in place. The second justification was that the use of agriculture surveys will help collect information on all 11 sub indicators using one data collection instrument thus avoiding the additional work of integrating information from different data sources that are usually managed by different institutions and organizations at the country level. So just to simplify the process of uh, uh, coordination, etc., we thought that it would be better for us to collect all this information in one single source. And the third justification was that the use of agriculture surveys, with the use of agriculture surveys, for collecting information on 241. All information will be collected from the holding selected to a nationally representative samples, thus avoiding the problems associated with the use of different data sources. Okay. And fourth, farm survey is expected to be cost effective in comparison to putting in place um, monitoring systems such as soil and water sampling and laboratory testing uh, infrastructure. Uh, geographical information system and robust administrative uh, record system that are maintained and updated on on regular basis. Um, however, just to tell you that, as I mentioned, uh, you know, during my presentation, the that farm survey are very well suited to measure the economic dimension of sustainability of an agriculture holding. It may not be an ideal tool for measuring the environmental and social sustainability of the agriculture holding. Uh, so typically environmental um, impacts of agriculture are measured through monitoring systems, as I mentioned earlier, like say, for example, remote sensing, soil and water sampling, or other tools associated with a specific area rather than a single agriculture holding. 
In addition, we do understand that for several environmental teams, it is unlikely that the farmer would be able to assess the environmental impact of their farming practices on issues like fertilizer pollution and pesticide use. Um, so using farm survey instead of environmental monitoring system would therefore employ moving away from measuring outcomes or impacts to assessing farmer practices and behaviors which are more subjective. Similarly, the information in the social uh, dimension is generally captured through household surveys. While in the majority of uh, cases, agriculture farm holdings are closely associated with a given household, it is not always the case. And therefore, uh, due care must be given to capturing this information through dedicated uh, uh, survey designs. Uh, having said that, the methodology of SG241 does offer the country is the flexibility of using combination of different data sources other than uh, agriculture surveys uh, which are which are called uh, um, alternative data sources okay so in the context of 241 we offer around the farm survey approach we offer two solutions one is the standalone farm survey questionnaire model which i i have been talking about this is um, and the second one is Agri-Survey Program and 50 by 2030 Initiative, which um, my colleague, Mr. Flavio Bolliger talked about the other day. Um, and in terms of alternative data sources, as I mentioned earlier, there are several that can be considered for reporting some of the selected sub-indicator of SG241, which include Earth Observation or Geographical Information System and Remote Sensing, Administrative Records, uh, household surveys, monitoring systems, and agriculture censuses, etc. Now, the let's take every option that I have listed here in turn. Okay, so let's focus first on the farm survey approach. So the first option within the farm survey approach is the standalone survey questionnaire, which is designed as a module that contain the minimum set of questions needed to collect information on and assess SG241 um, at the farm and later at the national level. So um, it is flexible as it can be administered independently or attached as a separate module um, to an agriculture survey, or it could also be integrated at appropriate places Within existing, within existing national farm surveys. Um, and we have been doing this integration um, in many countries, like say, for example, Vietnam, Nepal, Peru, Colombia, just to exemplify a few countries uh, whom we have been working with and currently working on. So uh, cognitive tests of, the, of this survey module were carried out in uh, Mexico, Bangladesh, and Rwanda back in 2017 and 18. Um, this was obviously to refine the survey questionnaire from design flow comprehension, recall, and respondent judgment perspective, and to assess if the question asked are sufficient and fully understood by a limited number of heterogeneous respondents. Um, then extended, um, Tests were carried out in, um, in Bangladesh, which I've been referring to throughout my presentation. Um, and this was to um, test and uh, revise the proposed criteria to collect data to test the sustainability criteria, um, determine the time of the survey, uh, revise the data scripts and routines that we have developed to analyze the Bangladesh pilot tests and revise accordingly the methodological note and support documents. So this uh, standalone survey questionnaire is, um, um, is structured in five distinct sections with relevant questions about, um, about each section. So the very first section is uh, is focus uh, on the introduction, introduction to the survey module and identification of the holding and the holder. The second section collect information about area of the holding, which we, which we have been discussing. discussing. 
um, by agriculture land use classes and as well land tenure, etc. Then section three has questions related to economic dimension of the holding. Section four has questions uh, required for the environmental dimension of the holding. And section five addresses the questions um, or captures the questions related to the social dimension of the holding. Okay. So this is the survey model, which I showed you very briefly the other day as well. It's uh, already available online on SDG 241 webpage. And it has been shared with you as, uh, as a resources for you to read before this training. So uh, it's very straightforward, simple to uh, go through and read through. Um, so, but, but anyways, if you are interested, you can always go back to, you know, this instrument by clicking on this link. Now, apart from, um, you know, the survey module, uh, which is, which contains the, obviously it's a questionnaire, we have developed support documents to go with the survey module so that the countries uh, are at ease in terms of their understanding of the, of this instrument. So we have developed an enumerator manual. Uh, we have developed an instruction manual for data entry operation and analysis. So once information is collected uh, at the field, what do you do then with the data? Okay. Then we have developed guidelines on data analysis to compute the sub indicators. So once the data is entered using this manual, how then you play with the data or analyze the data for you to compute or construct the sub indicators. Uh, we have produced a document on sampling guidance for SG241 as well. And we have developed this FAO statistical toolkit, which comprises of a code book, tabulation plan, and modular status scripts to support data analysis. Now, obviously, uh, depending on the country context, you know, these, this, this toolkit needs to be updated and revised accordingly. Okay. So, um, uh, it should be used with caution because uh, this toolkit was developed to analyze the Bangladesh data that was collected using the survey model. So if a country is collecting this information within the context of their agriculture survey, they, they should take clues or take guidance from the toolkit, but you know, it shouldn't be replicated because uh, it was designed for a specific purpose. So let's go through each of these um, support documents in turn. So the enumerator manual uh, has been developed to train the enumerators, surveyors, and the supervisors before their field deployment to administer the questionnaire. Um, it consists of the definition of the key terms, concepts, and the meaning behind the questions asked in the survey module. Um, it, provides uh, guidance to use to the use of uh, skip questions and uh, filter questions. And uh, it has examples of commonly encountered uh, instances or uh, commonly encountered problems or issues where question and responses may not be easy to administer and record uh, respectively. Uh, mind you, this uh, enumerator manual uh, will be, we, we are making full efforts to make this available in all UN languages, at least. Then uh, instruction manual on data entry operations uh, has been developed to describe data entry operations. That is all step that must be performed in order to organize the collected data into Excel spreadsheets or uh, in any other statistical package, which, which could be Stata, R, or SPSS, or any other. Uh, the procedures to process and analyze data collected and construct the 11 sub indicators according to the dashboard approach. Um, however, this document assumes that the enumerators and data analysts are, are familiar with the survey questionnaire and the methodology of SCG241 respectively. If not, the enumerator and the data and the analyst are strongly encouraged to carefully read and get familiar with the 
uh, with the with the documentation with, with these four documents before proceeding with reading this instruction manual. Guidelines on data analysis and uh, reporting are designed for use by uh, both data producers and as well as uh, data users. It is meant for uh, government data and uh, statistical authorities, um, the private sector, civil society, researchers, and other organizations that generate and or use data and statistics for calculating um, SCG 241. It provides uh, stepwise guidance on how to generate data um, and as well uh, calculation of thresholds and eventual reporting of the 11 sub indicators at the dashboard and aggregate SDG 241 as well. Then we have a sampling uh, guidance document, which, uh, which I briefly touched upon during my presentation. It provides information on the sampling design, sample size, sampling units and frames, um, the reporting units, the different estimation domains, okay? The estimator and stratification variables, sample allocation in the strata and other issues related to SG241 sample selection. Again, um, because the different countries will be using different uh, sampling frames. Some will be using list frames, other will be using uh, area frames, and some will be using a mix of both. So in that case, obviously the sampling guidance on SG241 is a broad, um, a broad guideline as to how countries can go about uh, then refining or redefining their sampling design for them to be able to um, um, uh, generate estimate about SG 241 indicators, which are nationally representative as well as uh, reliable and statistically significant. Um, then we have developed uh, e-learning courses um, around SG 241 uh, methodology. It provides information on the key aspects of the indicator. Um, covers the scope, the coverage, the dimension, the themes, the sub-indicator, periodicity, data collection, and reporting uh, processes and mechanisms, etc. So the e-learning course um, is already available online. Um, hopefully, you know, uh, very soon it will be available in, uh, in different UN languages as well. For the time being, it's in, it's in English. I believe, uh, you know, either it is, already available in Spanish or French, or it will be available fairly soon. Um, in any case, this e-learning course is also available on SCG241 webpage. You can always go to the webpage and uh, it's, a, it's a very nice resource for you to get trained on, on the indicator. And towards the end of this e-learning course, you will be awarded uh, a sort of uh, a certificate, okay? Um, for completion of the of the e-learning course. So it's good that you have taken this uh, very exhaustive uh, training on SG241 um, because now for you going to this e-learning will refresh your memories and uh, strengthen your understanding of the indicator even more. So these are the support documents which I've been talking about in my in, in, in the previous slides. All these are available um, on SCG241 webpage. Okay, so all these documents which I've been talking about are built around this survey module that we have created for SCG241, standalone survey module. Now, option two, which was uh, discussed by Mr. Flavio Boliger the other day. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of uh, this option, but just to refresh your memories. The idea here was to leverage and capitalize on agri survey program, which is um, soon to be scaled up to um, 50 by 2030 initiative that aims to support 50 low and lower middle income countries with the survey program by 2030. So we have um, put in efforts uh, over the past uh, three years to um, integrate not only SCG241 data requirements, but other farm survey-based SCG indicators for which FAO is custodian agency, 
into into these two uh, flagship uh, projects um, of uh, of FAO. Um, in this respect, for the agri survey program, like uh, you know, Flavio elaborated uh, uh, in detail on this, we integrated SG two four one requirements into into the core module, and as well as uh, we have another solution, which is we integrated the question into the economy and PME modules. Now, if you may remember, the agri survey program questionnaire is 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 divided into into different modules, right? So some are fixed, which are administered every year, which is a core module, and other are rotating, uh, which is the economy, PME, and, uh, and other um, uh, modules. For the 50 by 2030 initiative, we have integrated 241 question in the PME module, which is production methods and environment, um, allowing for SE241 collection in one single area. In any case, you can always go back to Flavio's presentation that we will share with you, or maybe we have already shared with you uh, for you to have uh, a good understanding as to how we went about integrating SDG 241 into these two projects. Uh, here, is the, here are the snapshots of the documents that have already been published. So we have a published handbook on agriculture integrated survey. Now, as Flavio mentioned the other day, this handbook was finalized back in 2017, I believe. So back then the methodology of SG241 was not yet finalized. So this Agris handbook, which is available freely online and you can always download it, um, doesn't have SG241 requirements uh, you know, built in into the into the um, aggressive methodology however later on we developed this technical note for countries who who are or will be the beneficiary of aggressive survey program or those who uh, on themselves want to want to implement um, aggressive um, aggress approach um, we have developed this technical note on how to mainstream SG241 in Agris and 50 by 2030 initiative. So as, um, and the option three is the use of alternative data sources. So we, we discussed the uh, data collection approaches around farm survey and um, the use of alternative data sources for, uh, for each sub indicator we have identified, apart from agriculture surveys, um, which is given in column in column three here, for which the methodology is designed of, uh, for which the every sub indicator methodology is designed to be collected using agriculture survey, as per current methodology. However, um, you know we understand that uh, some information about these sub indicator can, can be collected through other data sources. Um, just to exemplify farm output value per hectare, uh, for it information can be collected in um, agriculture or livestock census. Um, some information about um, uh, at least the crop productivity can be um, estimated using GIS and remote sensing. Uh, some countries collect this information about, about livestock and crops as well within the context of their household survey or there could very well be other specialized studies and so on. So for each sub indicator, we have identified potential or possible alternative data sources that the countries can use for them to be able to report on the respective uh, sub indicators of SG241 if, if their agriculture survey lacks the questions or the information about SG241. Now, just to uh, you know, um, take note of one important consideration. So several aspects um, needs to be carefully considered prior to using alternative data sources in order to produce consistent and reliable data as per recommended periodicity, which is set at three years, um, as well to respect the scope of the indicator, which is covering crops and livestock or a mix of both. 
So it is advised that the use of alternative data sources may be considered when available data set fulfill the following criteria. Uh, so first of all, it should be demonstrated that alternative data sources um, respects the recommended certification. That is the farm typologies, um, the sector, uh, the sector of the holding, production system, whether it's crop, livestock, or mixed, and um, as to whether this holding is using water for irrigation or not. Um, and the data, it should be made sure that data are available at same level of territorial disaggregation as farm survey. Okay. Secondly, you know, it should be made sure that the alternative data sources capture the same phenomena as proposed by the farm survey. Okay. Um, it should be compliant with international or national standards and classification system to be internationally comparable. Um, can be reflected or attributed to agricultural land area in the country, considering different farm typologies and agricultural regions. Um, and respect the reference and periodicity so that it is homogeneous across the uh, sub indicators. Now, this alternative data sources can also be used to complement the farm survey data. Okay, it can be used to. Uh, this combined approach has the potential to improve the validity and soundness of the results, in particular in countries that have well-established monitoring systems um, and that are able to produce quality information uh, consistently over time. It is always advised for them to use alternative data sources in complementarity with, with farm survey. This information from other sources may be used and leveraged in different ways, depending on quality and regularity of its collection. For example, um, it can replace the farm survey questions when alternative sources of information are available and respond to the criteria mentioned on the previous slide. Um, it can complement farm survey questions by providing additional contextual information that is helpful to interpret um, that is helpful to interpret the results. Um, it can be used to cross check the farm survey results to identify any inconsistencies and ensure the robustness of the indicator. This validation exercise can be done both exposed or during the data collection by uh, providing the external data to the enumerator before going to the field. In this way, the enumerator can probe whether the responses to the surveys are consistent with the uh, a priori external knowledge. Uh, in any case, it is recommended that countries complement the farm survey information with, with, with uh, information from, from other sources. Um, this will provide, um, as this will provide additional information and help cross-checking the robustness of SG241 with regards to um, the different dimensions uh, um, uh, captured within the framework of SG241. So I stop here. This is, um, let me just quickly show you all these documents which I just uh, talked about. Uh, Stefania, if in the meanwhile, if there is some question, I'm happy to take those. Let me display the. Yes, actually, there is a question, but it's on the secure tenure rights to land. So. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So um, if they are asking, can you please kindly review the, the indicator secure rights, secure tenure rights to land? Because in the exercise uh, uh, file that you have presented, there were answers yes and no, but uh, what do we do with the answer don't know or refuse to answer? Okay, 
So all of this information on what to do with um, non-response or um, with no responses or uh, don't want to res respond have been, as I was mentioning, is, is captured in the data analysis uh, document. So I would suggest to you to go to the document for you to not only get information about um, no response, but you know, um, other responses uh, that are that are given in the question apart from yes and no. So instead of going into the specificity of this particular sub indicator, I would suggest to you to go to the support document. Let me just show you as to as to what documents I've been talking about, which will be helpful in answering this question as well as many others that you may have around um, around um, once the data is collected, how do you then proceed with the different options that have been given in the question. So as you can see here, we are on SG 241 web page. No, we don't see anything. Okay. Okay, now yes. So as you can, as all of you can see, we are an SG241 dedicated uh, web page that we are maintaining regularly and updating regularly as we proceed. So here you will find all of the information that we covered as part of this training and, and even more uh, to you keep yourself abreast of the developments that are happening you know, on the indicator um, on different fronts whether it's methodological, data collection, capacity development, et cetera, or reporting. So as I was showing you the other day, you know, here you will find uh, the information clubbed into different categories. So on the methodology, we'll see the, the metadata that we submitted back in 2015, and then we kept on revising it. Um, it, it gives a concise and crisp information as to what the indicator is about. Then the methodological note, which is already available in Arabic, Spanish, and French, and it will be available in Chinese and Russian fairly soon. Then the data collection and reporting, whereby we have the FAO questionnaire, which, uh, which Stefania will explain in her presentation. The survey module that I just covered as part of the presentation um, before, uh, during the session. The sampling guidance for SCG indicator 2.4.1, guidelines on data analysis and reporting. And here you will find, you know, all your question answered related to data analysis as to what to do with no responses and non-response and I don't want to respond. What to do with those, right? So you will get your question answered once you are in that stage by reading this document. Then instruction manual on data interoperations and enumerator manual for the survey module, okay? Then, you know, all of the capacity development, um, you know, efforts that we have undertaken in the past um, to improve uh, countries' abilities and capabilities for them to collect information and report data on the indicator. So a similar kind of bilateral or, um, you know, um, bilateral workshops and conversations and consultations were carried out with many countries. Some were designed like, uh, you know, this training whereby we invited over a group of countries to go through the methodology and data collection processes of SC241. And here is the e-learning course, which I just spoke about. So you just click on this link and uh, you will be able to, um, you know, get yourself trained once again in a different way, in a more uh, virtual and interactive way for you to be able to, um, you know, equip yourself uh, and strengthen your concepts uh, as for 241 is concerned. And then we have other related links, which are, you know, which are um, very good because uh, it gives you the contextual information 
around SDG 241 as to how we went about developing the indicator. And then you have information on the focal points. So you can just simply click on, on, on these. And this is the um, SDG indicator page. So if you have question beyond 241 about any other SDG indicator, um, the, the 21 uh, that we are custodian agency for, then in this case, you can, you can click here and ask us the question directly. Or if you have a specific question related to 241, we have already been interacting with you and um, you know through, through SDG 241, through this email address. So if you have any question or query, you can always come back to us uh, um, by writing to us, okay? So I just stop sharing. Okay, perfect. So we have seen uh, the theoretical parts and notions with Aspandjar. We have seen the data collection tools. Now let's move to another practical part. So I will show, I will show now how FAO gets the data on the SDG 241 from countries, meaning the SDG 241 questionnaire, which you have uh, all received on uh, August last year and you will soon receive it once again during the uh, coming months, for the coming months. So we have uh, uh, one single questionnaire that comes in Excel format, and it's indeed the key uh, instrument to collect data uh, from countries. It covers all the three dimensions and all the 11 indicators that we have seen in these days. Uh, it is sent to countries once a year, even if uh, uh, we have seen that the periodicity for the SDG 241 is three years. But in this way, we can monitor the availability of data on an, on an annual basis, since it is a brand new indicator. Uh, we can identify changes and get the data points through the years, considering also that often we do not get many data, especially now that we are at the starting phases. Assess the country needs in terms of capacity development. So, for example, technical assistance and trainings. Uh, so, exactly how we did for this training. And lastly, confirm uh, uh, the national focal points contacts, which is always a crucial information for us so that we are in contact immediately with uh, the appropriate person. So, what we have done so far. We have tested the questionnaire in 45 countries through a pilot exercise carried out from December 2019 to April 2020. Initially, the questionnaire was only in English, and we have translated uh, it in July 2020 into three official UN languages, which, is, which are Arabic, French, and Spanish. And uh, uh, then we have had our first official dispatch on August 10th last year. We have sent a question to 195 countries, including your countries, of course. Uh, so the questionnaire has been sent to the SDG 241 focal points, to the general SDG focal point, to the head of NSO, and we have copied all the FAO offices and the relevant people. I'm going to show the results of this pilot uh, test uh, uh, and the um, uh, official dispatch right after this presentation. We have improved the layout following, uh, of course, country comments that got uh, uh, from the dispatcher from the pilot. So here it is shown how the question is organized. So it is composed uh, uh, by eight uh, worksheets. We have three um, introductory sections. So the core page, the instruction, the definitions. We have the three uh, data reporting sections, so for one for each dimension and two supplementary information sections for the metadata for the, for the feedback. So I'm going to show in detail all of this in a minute. This is a preview of how the question is displayed. So you can see the different sheets uh, here at the bottom. So let's see in detail these eight of, uh, sections. So the first one, the cover page, ask a country a specific information. So meaning the national focal point concept detail that, as I said, it's a key information for us for having smooth communication with the country. Uh, there is a page only uh, with instruction on how to complete the questionnaire. 
and it gives also an overview of the Western structure. And it is very important that you go through this section before filling the question properly. And it's followed by another page that explains the definition and the, of the key concepts and, and the terms and the international standard used. So uh, all those sections are very important to fill properly the questions. Um, so um, the second section of the is the core of the question, let's say. So it's where the data are requested, meaning where the country needs to fill uh, the spaces with the data. And uh, uh, this includes all the three dimensions, as I said, so the three sub-indicators for the economic, the five uh, uh, for the environmental, and then again, the three for the social dimensions. And this is how uh, they are displayed. So the last section, as I said, it's about the supplementary information. Uh, so with the metadata part, quite intuitive. It collects metadata on country coverage, source of data, unit of measurement, frequency of data collection, and so on. And finally, the feedback section, that is simply a survey with 10 questions that help us understanding if some areas still need to be uh, improved. So now let me show you how to fill the Excel properly. So the first page, so it's a cover page, is like this one. You need to fill these columns with the National Focal Point contact detail, even if this has already been shared and sent to FAO in the past. This will help us understand if the focal point is confirmed or if uh, he or she has been changed. And about that, uh, these are the focal point contact details that we have for your country and the response rates of the pilot phase if your country was part of it and of the 2020 dispatch. So where the space is left blank is, means that we don't have yet any SDG 241 focal point. So I please ask these countries to provide us this information as soon as possible. So Australia, Bhutan, Brunei, Cambodia, etc. While where you see the red box, it means that we do have the focal institution, but we do not have a specific focal point name. So you can imagine how it is crucial for us to, uh, uh, to get immediate in contact with the appropriate person. So I kindly ask also uh, these countries uh, to write uh, me in the chat if they want now or e by email uh, to inform us uh, or the about the, the focal point, so not only the focal institution, or I mean, if the focal point has changed, so whatever information is very important for us. Um, so in this case, um, Fiji, India, Japan, and Laos uh, are the countries where we miss the focal point name. So concerning the response rates, so you can see uh, the uh, Y and the N, uh, if uh, the country sent the questionnaire back or not. So for the 2019 column, for example, um, so we are talking about the pilot phase. It means that, for example, um, so Cambodia, Fiji, India were part of the pilot test, uh, but none of them replied, while Malaysia uh, did. For the 2020 columns, it is related to the first comprehensive dispatch of last year. And you can see, uh, we still have many countries that didn't respond. Um, we know that this is still a starting phase and we hope, we do hope to have some data from your countries uh, for this second dispatch plan, planned for next month. So for the three data reporting sections, you will have two pre-filled columns with the values that your countries have provided in the 2020 dispatch. So the 2019 columns, column includes data of the year 2019, while the 2018 columns includes data of the year 2018 and before. Uh, this is because last year we have asked to report the latest data available here. So it could be 2018 as well as 2017, 16 and so on. So if the data you provide in the 2020 dispatch was referring to the year 2015, for example, 
you will find them in the 2018 column. So please note that those columns are not to be modified unless you have any updated information for those year. Uh, so let's say that last year you provided some provisional data and now you have final data, so you can change the data in these columns. So actually you only need to fill the 2020 column. So these columns need to be filled with the values or with the percentage following the described the criteria. So referring only to the year 2020, uh, the reference year uh, that we use is the calendar year from January to December. We have seen this. Uh, if there is no data available in your country, you insert zero if it is not occurring, but potential applicable, or you can put NA, so not applicable, if it is really not applicable at all. Uh, this uh, second column that has to be filled is notes, where you should insert explanation in case data reporting using different national definitions, so not the ones described in the definition worksheets, or if the data are reporting using a different reference period, so not the calendar year from January to December. If uh, there has been any changes in the columns 2018 and 2019, so that for us it's more easy uh, to understand if you have made some changes. So if you have, please write in the uh, in the notes and any other relevant information that you think are useful for us that we will be analyzing your questionnaires. So about the other sections, the metadata section is composed by a big table with all the 11 indicators listed and the columns where you can specify for each of them, all these metadata listed here. So type of variable, availability, use of measurements and so on. And the last big bet, as I said, there are six questions with the scale response from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then you have four open questions if the country wants to suggest uh, uh, something more uh, in detail. So that's all uh, concerning the question that we will be uh, sending uh, next month and we have sent also last year. Do you have any question about the questionnaire? Till now, there is no question in chat box. Uh, uh, participant okay. can ask uh, directly as well. Or uh, do you have any comments? Please feel free to ask. Okay, it seems we don't have uh, any question. Yeah, perfect. So just one maybe remark, please. Uh, when, uh, when filling the questionnaire, read carefully all the instructions because uh, you have a lot of information in the in the excel so if you have any doubts if you go in detail in all the description and the instruction which are in the in the excel you will find for sure the 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 answer of your question but of course in case uh, uh, you don't have uh, you don't find the solution you can write us uh, and we will be happy to to, to help you filling the, uh, the questionnaire. I think we can break now before moving to the next presentation. As uh, do uh, you think we can break half an hour or maybe a little bit less today? I would say let's break out for maybe 15 minutes rather than half an hour, just to, just to make sure that we we cover everything that we are supposed to, right? Yes. Welcome back. Hope you have had uh, a nice break. Um, Asfandia, we have one question from Indonesia. So um, they are asking, 
is it okay if there is a difference in the time period of the survey answers between household and company? So where the household only usually use a period of one year ago from the day of enumeration, while for companies using the calendar year in recording the economic activities. Must households have difficulty remember when using a calendar year? So yeah, that's uh, that's fine. And we understand that, you know, the survey cannot be administered for both these sectors simultaneously in most cases. And as you rightly pointed out, I mean, and the company may be maintaining its financial record um, using a financial year while the or, or a fiscal year while the household may be using calendar year as long as you know the survey results um, you know um, published are referring to um, a common year let's say for example uh, 20, 2021 in this case or maybe 2020 or 2019 uh, it's okay if the two survey time periods, uh, you know, vary by four or five or six months. I mean, that's uh, that's that, that's fairly usual. Okay, so I think I can move now with my next presentation. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, uh, now we'll present the uh, findings of the comprehensive dispatch that we have carried out last year. Let me quickly give you some background. So, from December to May 2020, we have carried out a pilot test with 45 countries using the SDG 241 questionnaire. We have then analyzed uh, the results of the test and refined the questionnaire. And in August 2020, the FAO data collection question was dispatched for the first time to the member countries, so 195 uh, uh, in total. What uh, are the objectives of the dispatch? So the main scope is collecting data from all the 195 countries <coughs> using the questionnaire. Specifically, we want to understand the availability of data, although we already know that availability of data in these first years will be low. In particular, we are interested in actual data, but also in understanding the current data availability relevant to sustainable agriculture. Then to, her, to help in further design and implementation of the SDG 241, uh, medium-term data collection strategy. This uh, leverages strongly on the farm survey-based data collection efforts that are currently being implemented in countries and this under the Agri-Survey Program, the 50 by 2030 initiatives, and the global strategy space tool. Uh, then evaluate uh, the country needs in terms of capacity development and technical support on SDG 241. That is why we have organized these uh, virtual trainings. And last but not least, uh, as I said before, get country focal points contact details, which means confirming what we already know or getting new information. So the time frame for the dispatch process was uh, set from August to uh, mid-March 2021. There has been a coordination and discussion with several countries. And we finally prepare a report with uh, the results in April 2021. Uh, please note that, of course, some countries that replied after that time, uh, so after 15 March 2021, are unfortunately not part of the final report, so not part of this presentation. Uh, let's just say a few words on this 2020 dispatch. So, for sure, results, generally speaking, have improved compared to the uh, pilot test. Though uh, significant efforts still have to be done by almost all member countries, considering the low data availability of many sub-indicators. However, we do not have to forget this. This was only the first year of data collection. So indeed, we know that the reporting periodicity recommended by the methodology for the SDG 241 is three years. So we can really make conclusions only 
uh, at the end of 2020, sorry, of 2022. So now let's move to the results of the dispatch. So what, what we have learned, I would call uh, the 2020 dispatch in numbers. So we had uh, 106 countries that acknowledged the receipts of the questionnaires, which means, which means the 54%, uh, so a bit more than a half. 86 countries sent the questionnaire back, either partially filled or completely filled, which was the 44%. 40 countries stated to have data or partial data available, which is the 21%. And among those, 23 provided the actual data, which means the 12%. 46 countries stated not having any data, it's uh, 24%. And finally, 40, 46 filled the feedback sections, which is 24%. So below you can find uh, uh, the percentage that we have got for these uh, uh, um, items in the, in the pilot test. So these are the 23 countries that provided actual data so not just simply stated to have data, but provided actual data based on existing data, based on proxies, based on anecdotal knowledge, or based on expert judgment. So United Kingdom is the only country that managed to provide data on all the 11 sub-indicators. Denmark and Hungary also were very good and provided data on 10 sub-indicators. Bahrain, Belarus, and Malawi on nine, and so on. So without reading all of them until, of course, uh, uh, this group, so the last group that managed to provide data on one sub indicator each, which is still very good uh, uh, for us. So many respondents that didn't report any actual data highlighted any way that some uh, data were available or partially available for some of the sub indicators although they didn't provide any actual value. So probably in the next year, so we will get actual data also from these countries. Another uh, uh, highlight uh, that I would like to say is that many countries, um, sorry, that the, um, data may be available for some of the sub indicators uh, in the near future, of course. So since the periodicity of reporting the 241, we said it's three years, it's important to highlight that uh, also uh, the countries that they did not report any new number in the comprehensive dispatch, but did it in the pilot test. And those countries are Canada, Indonesia, Burkina Faso, and Kazakhstan. So these slides illustrate the summary findings of the analysis by sub-indicators, considering only the 40 countries that responded with some data. So with uh, percentage of values, or also that indicated to have data partially or fully available, or through proxy. So these are the 40 countries that uh, responded this way. So in short, from this chart, it can be seen that uh, sub-indicators are relatively, which can be seen which sub-indicators are relatively more challenging to report on, especially in terms of unavailability of data. Uh, so in general, the availability is not high. It's not high, but compared to the pilot test results, our percentage has much more improved. We are going to see this more in detail in the next slide. So specifically, the sub-indicators, prevalence of soil degradation, management of pesticides, and fees are the least reported. So the ones uh, here visualized. Um, I would like to stress here the importance to respond with any data you have. So at, the, at this stage, it is as to begin reporting with also partial data or even by using proxies, as some country already have done. So you can see in these slides, really it's very useful, everything uh, at this starting phase. 
for this first dispatch, uh, we see that still percentage of data are not available are quite high. I would say uh, specifically for the some indicators in the uh, environmental dimension, so the five uh, yeah, in the middle. But this is possible because this kind of information are not usually collected in agricultural surveys or census. And maybe even if basic data are collected at the country level, we know that the SDG 241 methodology requires specific and additional information for compilation and reporting uh, uh, of the different sub indicators. So, so, of course, we totally understand. So, as I said, let's compare the pilot versus the comprehensive dispatch. So, in these slides, we have tried to give a snapshot of the comparison. So this percentage shown here are an average based on the 11 sub indicators reported by the 23 countries for the pilot, 23 out of 45, and the 40 out of 195 for the comprehensive dispatch. So basically in the pilot, we have got, as I said, considering all the 11 sub indicators, 71% of not availability answer with the, a peak of 87% uh, for fees and the lowest rate got for the secure tenure right to land with about uh, 57%. So this percentage can be compared uh, here with the 49% of, uh, of data not available for the dispatch. And uh, uh, so 57% uh, for these three sub indicators, so, so prevalence of soil degradation, management of pesticide and fees, and the lowest rate of 35% for farm out value per hectare and uh, secure tenure right to land. So we can easily see how these results evidence, uh, evidence and, and high improvement in the response rates. Same can be seen for the availability of response. Let me go uh, down here. So we have 13% as average in the pilot test compared to the 30% in the dispatch. And the same, so a peak of 39 for the pilot, while for the dispatch we had 58. And the lowest rate of 4% in the pilot and 15% for all these three sub indicators for the comprehensive dispatch. So even here, big improvement. While little changes, I can say, uh, we can see uh, for the unclear methodology, almost the same percentage, and partial availability and, and proxies. So all these improvements uh, are surely linked uh, to the three virtual trainings that we have carried out last year, <coughs> managing to train almost 30 countries, meaning about 300 national staff, and the several one-to-one -one meetings that uh, we have managed to carry out during the whole year. That's why we have also organized this year other five virtual trainings to try to reach as many countries as possible because we understand that it's very important to train country properly because it's a complicated uh, um, sub -in, uh, indicator, SDG indicator. So analyzing the answers given by countries, we managed to understand something even more specific about few, few indicators. Specifically for the three sub indicators, uh, uh, segue terrorized land, farm output value per hectare, and risk mitigation mechanism, the data situation is relatively good especially for the secure tenure rights to land, which is the most reported sub-indicator of the comprehensive dispatch with about 58% of countries that stated to have data available. We imagine this is due to the reason that information on land tenure is usually collected using census. In fact, uh, 26 countries that had data available either through actual data or partially available. And also many countries stated that they even do not collect data on this sub-indicator because it's, it's the well-defined law 
guarantees that 100% of farmland have documentation that ensures secure tenure rights to land. So prevalence of soil degradation and manage, management of fertilizers are apparently the tools of indicators where information is available, but usually partially. So nine countries uh, for each of these uh, two sub indicators. And <clears throat> I would say that management of fertilizers is the sub indicator where 15% uh, of countries stated to have data available through proxies. Wage rate of agriculture, farm out value per hectare, per variation in water availability and the fees are the ones where further clarity on the methodology is required. Especially would say uh, wage rate in agriculture, uh, we, that uh, have been requested by three countries. And finally, we already said this in the previous slide. So these three sub indicators are uh, the, the list reported. <coughs> so for each of them, 23 countries did not have data to calculate these uh, three sub indicators. So here is visualize the specific overview of data availability for your countries for all the 11 sub indicators. This slide, of course, takes in consideration only the countries that sent us back the questionnaire field. And this is why we have only uh, Maldives and Philippines. So we can see that Maldives um, provided actual data. So not only stated to have data, but provided actual data on four sub-indicators, the one, the sixth, the seventh, and the ninth. <coughs> while Philippines stated to have data available on two and uh, uh, partial available on other six. So we can, we hope that Philippines for this year, they will send also uh, actual data. So not only stated to have data, though they don't only will state to have data. So concerning the feedback section, here we can see uh, in one chart all the questions asked and the answers through the scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. So the fixed best session uh, focused on gathering user comments on the quality and the structure of the SDG 241 questionnaire, as I said uh, in the previous uh, presentation. And we have got uh, uh, comments and suggestions from 46 countries especially would say on the clarity of question instructions and definition and on the perceived logic of the questionnaire structure, we wish, which were instrumental in identifying possible uh, areas of improvement. So we can easily see that question one and question five uh, were the questions that most countries were in agreement. And this is the same results that we got in the pilot phase. That means that in general, we have sent the question to the right person and that no important questions and categories and commodities were missing. While we uh, would say that question six is the question for which countries are more in disagreement, meaning the time required to fill the question was quite long. But unfortunately, I mean, we all know that uh, it's not uh, easy. So comparing the results uh, of the feedbacks uh, with the pilot test, we can see that also here the answers uh, um, are, I mean, here the answers are quite similar. However, uh, a slight improvement on all questions is not in. So you can see all have raised a little bit with the exception of the question just mentioned about the time and the efforts required to fill the question and maybe a little bit also um, the lack of important question category and commodities. But I would say more important, there was an evidence, uh, a big improvement on question three about the clarity of definition. And uh, as I said, uh, probably this is all due to the uh, virtual trainings carried out and to the one-to-one -one meetings we have ahead. Finally, analyzing the open-ended question, we can say that in general, countries find in 
together to form one methodology challenging and complex. And that even after having gone through the methodology, there is a lack of data availability. And that it is difficult to collect the diverse data needed from uh, different data providers. And we already said that for sure, calculating this indicator is very demanding in terms of sometimes. Moreover, countries indicated the environmental dimension was the most complicated. And finally, there were some suggestions. So that I suggested to have more guidance and assistance, and maybe having clear instruction on how to fill the question itself. And that's why we have also improved a little bit the structure of the question this year to make it more clear. And, uh, and that's why also we have, again, organized these trainings to help you uh, understand better the methodology. Uh, about the technical assistance, let me remind you that if country needs assistance, please, uh, uh, you need to send officially the request to us with the FAO country office and the regional office in copy. So this must be really an official request. So on this la last slide, we have highlighted some conclusions and steps. So although there is the low response rate and the low availability of data, there is a high level of interest from countries to implement the SDG 241. And we definitely understood that all efforts carried out last year on the capacity development activities have been much appreciated and that, of course, there is a need for them. So uh, looking at the next steps, as I already mentioned before, we have translated the SDG 241 main material in Arabic, Spanish, and French. And we are already, um, we have already translated the remaining docs documents in French and Spanish. And we will soon have them online and also online the e-learning course translated in French and Spanish. As Vanya said, uh, maybe it was already online, not yet, but in the coming days, not even month, the weeks, but in the coming days, we will have them online. We have initiated and we will continue the work stream to explore the possibility of using alternative data sources to calculate some of the sub indicators. So in progress, we have started this virtual training. So you know, you are the third group for this year, 2021. And we are providing also technical assistance to four countries. So two in Latin America, one in Asia and one in Africa. And finally, uh, as I already said, we plan to have the second comprehensive dispatch uh, late July or beginning of August uh, 2021. That's all. Any question on this? There is no question in chat box. Uh, so participant may be asked uh, directly by raising their hand. Uh, Benjamin, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Benjamin. Oh, sorry. Uh, I need to allow him to talk. I didn't realize he was in that. Oh, okay. Can, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Go okay, ahead. Well, first of all, thank you to, uh, to, to um, uh, Abab, Stefania, Thomas also for, for having this string. I think this was uh, uh, well, that was most needed and that was uh, well constructed. This, is, uh, this was really good, I think. Uh, just a remark in the case of Cambodia. I'm working for FAO in Cambodia. Um, for example, we will have our survey uh, under the 50 by 2030, our yearly annual survey, yeah, in, in September. If you send a form in August, uh, usually how, how long do you give countries to, to, to answer? You know, what, what, what is the deadline that you will provide for countries to, to give the answer? Because 
the next survey, <coughs> sorry, we will have, we, should, we will use the ILP module that, uh, that Flavio mentioned, which is the economic one that should help us to answer three of the sub-indicators. Also, uh, from last year's survey in 2020, we already had, uh, the, I, I think we can compile information on the sub-indicator on the um, on the uh, land tenure because we were measuring 5a1 so that should that should allow us also to measure the indicator on land tenure and we measure the the, the fees also uh, so this data should be available very soon it's being uh, tabulated slash analyzed now but i just want to know how long do you give countries to send the answers back to you over thank you Asfadia, you want to reply or I? I... Uh, so Benjamin, thank you. Thank you for this intervention. I mean, Stefania can reflect more, but uh, usually, I mean, we, we, we have adopted this structured process, right? Uh, whereby we send the questionnaire to countries um, at a certain time period uh, in an year. So basically for us, it's usually July and August every year. And then we, we uh, you know, use standard protocols in terms of uh, the deadlines that we give to countries for them to provide us with, with the numbers. So for this year, um, we, we are gonna be, uh, you know, setting the, the, the deadline for, for the countries to report back to FAO the 15th of September. Uh, Stefania, th this is what we we agreed on, right? Uh, we said 10 of September. So 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 yeah, yeah. So so 10th so 10th of September would be would be the date, uh, the first deadline that we will uh, um, give to countries for them to report back to us uh, with the numbers. Now, obviously, this is with the understanding that not many countries would be able to meet this deadline, and hence uh, we have. Um, made this process a bit flexible by by giving you know an extra week or two to countries for them to for them to reply to us but of of course i mean if uh, if there are exceptions like say for example if there is there are one or two countries who are really close in terms of uh, them analyzing their numbers and they request us um, you know in an email that they would need maybe another two to three weeks for them to, uh, you know, um, conduct the analysis and then report back. I mean, uh, we usually accommodate, uh, accommodate those kind of exceptions. Okay, thank you, Alba. I think it will <clears throat> it will be too too tight for us anyway because each service cycle is like it takes around ten months, you know, between data cleaning, uh, data analysis, and then the, the tabulation, the reporting. So. Uh, yeah, it, it just means that, yeah, every, if every cycle you do it in August, I'm just talking in the case of Cambodia, of course, huh? we would be able to report only the data from the previous year, from the previous survey to your, to your yearly request. Uh, if, I mean, this is just a comment for, for Cambodia, sorry. So just just to add to this as to why we have set the deadline um, as uh, as the one that I just mentioned in September. Now, as uh, as part of the reporting processes, because once country report to FAO, we then you know um, carry out this additional process of quality control and um, um, validation. So we then usually right back to countries in case we are doubtful about uh, or we you know we want further clarity on certain numbers that the countries share with us and that process takes time plus then we share it with the office of the chief statistician uh, all the information compiled for them to have a look and once they green signal it then we have to report it to united nations statistical division right at some point and uh, uh, for that process, we need to have everything prepared, not later than, uh, you know, um, November or December of, um, of each year. 
So for us to reflect the SDG estimates within the report published by UNSD, we have to uh, respect uh, you know, all these uh, uh, de deadlines. And hence we work backwards from those deadlines and we, we, we set accordingly the time frame um, using which the country has to report back to us for us to be able to report back to UNSD. Thank you, it makes absolute sense. Thank you so much. I would add just, uh, anyway, uh, Benjamin, we know and we take note and uh, uh, so Cambodia is not a problem that we report uh, the following year. So anyway, this is uh, a regular uh, uh, dispatch, so we will send every year. So Cambodia will report for the previous year. That's of course uh, uh, fine. Uh, are there any questions? Um, any other question? I don't think so. I don't see anything, Toma, right? Yeah, correct. There is no question. Let's uh, move forward. Okay. So um, I think now it's uh, we should move forward with the Aspandia presentation on the short, uh, medium, and long term expectation. And after that, we will move, we will give the floor to Indonesia. So Aspandia, you have the floor. So thank you, Stefania. Thank you once again. Um, I'll be very quick in terms of me delivering this presentation because uh, I think we are really pressed for time. We have uh, approximately an one hour, right? So can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, so very quickly. So this presentation summarizes as to what we have discussed until so far, uh, plus it goes um, you know, into some, some details as to how we reach a stage where we, are, we, we, where we are at now in terms of methodology, capacity development and data collection and reporting of SDG 241. So um, this presentation obviously will cover the progress made by FAO, uh, our planned future course of action and expectation in terms of country readiness to report on the indicator in the short, medium and long term. Our ultimate aim obviously is to maximize country reporting on this indicator and thereby gradually re reclassify it as tier one over time. In summary, um, we will cover the following topics. So what pro progress have we made on the methodological front, capacity development front, um, data, country data collection and uh, reporting to FAO. Toward the end of this presentation, we will openly discuss the constraints that impede the country efforts to implement the indicator and thereafter data collection and reporting and deliberate the means and ways on how to overcome these, uh, these constraints. So by now, you may have a very good idea that the indicator 241 is based on farm survey um, that is used as a main data collection instrument for all sub indicators to collect information from agriculture holdings using a nationally representative sample. Um, reaching at the stage where the methodology is now has been, um, has been a long participatory uh, and consultative process of discussions with experts, several rounds of testing, and um, follow-up technical work on the development of the methodological and support document. So as you can see here, I'm not gonna go into the details of every point, but we have conducted three expert group meetings, several round of, uh, in fact, one uh, online global consultation whereby we shared the methodology with all NSOs of uh, the member states, 195. And then we organized a couple of webinars with the IAEG STG. Then we conducted several rounds of testing, uh, test tests in Bangladesh, Kyrgyz Republic, Ecuador, Belgium, and Rwanda. We performed cognitive testing in Kenya, Mexico, and Bangladesh. We field tested the survey questionnaire in Bangladesh again. 
Um, uh, Stefania mentioned that we have also tested the FAO data collection questionnaire in 45 countries. Now all the background documents have been finalized and uploaded to FAO SDG portal or SDG webpage, which I showed you in the previous presentation. That is the methodological node survey questionnaire, sampling design, innovator manual, uh, calculation process procedure, FAO data collection question, and so on. So everything is on the SDG241 web page. In terms of um, uh, capacity development activities, uh, we have uh, by now trained, um, um, uh, we, we trained approximately 46 countries in 2019. The indicator was presented several times at different key events, both regional and global in nature. Uh, we conducted bilateral trainings in 2019 for, uh, for, for, for separate countries. And then we organized um, three virtual trainings on the line similar to the one that we are having now for, um, for several countries um, 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 belonging to different regions. As you can see in 2019, um, you know, we, we, uh, I was in Chiba, Japan. Okay, and uh, where we organized a physical workshop whereby all these countries, some of you were present there as well. Uh, like say, for example, colleagues from Japan, Indonesia, Fiji, and, uh, and many other countries who are uh, Philippines and, and, and others who are represented in this virtual work training as well were present in that physical workshop um, back in 2019. Then we organized three virtual trainings last year uh, in 2020, uh, covering several uh, countries. Indonesia again was part of was part of this uh, training. Um, then uh, uh, you know, and then we organized one for Latin America and one for uh, for African region and 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 Russia. Uh, this year, sorry, I forgot. So this year in 2021, before this virtual training, we organized uh, two um, already. One for Esqua country belonging to uh, Middle East, North Africa. And um, the second one for, uh, for African region. Uh, we, uh, we are then gonna, after this training, we are planning on conducting two more, one for European countries and one for Latin American countries later down this year. Um, additional uh, activities related to capacity development, as I already mentioned, e-learning courses uh, are already uh, uploaded online. So you can, you can go there and uh, you know, take these courses. Always a very good resource. Translation of the key documents is, uh, is already take, undertaken in Arabic, Spanish, and French, apart from English. And as mentioned, we are planning on translating it, it into Russian and, and, and Chinese as well. Um, and then we also take advantage of um, country missions of other in-house colleagues okay, who are traveling to countries for other reasons. Um, and then we provide them with the, with the needed information so that they can raise awareness about the indicator and help us confirm the national focal points with whom we regularly coordinate on the indicator and assess uh, if time allows the extent of national data availability on the indicator. In 2021, as I already mentioned, uh, we continued our virtual training amid COVID-19 because we cannot physically travel, um, which is which is a shame. But in any case, these virtual trainings, um, you know, um, uh, are successful beyond our ex expectations. So, uh, as I mentioned, we planned five this year. Out of which, this is the third one. Uh, we are left with two others, apart from the bilateral engagements that we are having with countries. Uh, we will translate all these documents into including e-learning in all six official languages, and uh, we are planning on developing digital lectures um, on the line similar to the one that we are having now um, to, to, to help countries, uh, you know, um, take advantage of those as and when um, 
how time allows them to, uh, to take the course. Uh, in terms of data collection, uh, as, as Stefania mentioned, uh, we have already developed Africa data collection questionnaire and reporting uh, protocols. Uh, the questionnaire was tested in 45 countries. I'm not going to go into details because Stefania covered it very well. So let me just um, um, avoid going into the details. Uh, in 2021, uh, I mean, again, we are in process. We are almost, we have almost, in fact, finalized the uh, the dispatch uh, to member states. So we, we are almost ready to send it out. We are going to do that hopefully um, towards the end of this month. Um, then we will, of course, as I was mentioning, we, 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 we perform data collection steps. Then we do some sort of uh, internal analysis, gap filling, quality, quality assurance and quality control processes. Uh, we draft the analysis and then finalize it for reporting to UNSD, which I was mentioning that we, we, have, we, we are bound by that sort of external deadline and hence we work backwards, uh, setting the deadlines accordingly for us and for, for the countries in terms of them reporting the data on the indicator. Uh, reporting expectation for 2022, 2020-2021, we experienced low response rates to SG241, which was evident in Stefania's presentation, both for the pilot phase as well as for the comprehensive dispatch. But this was expected uh, as well as um, provided us with, with an indication that the indicator is complex and in general, the country lacks on data. So the short-term um, you know, expectation is that most of the country will be reporting SG241 using a partial dashboard, which is fine. So instead of like, you know, if countries are not ready, so instead of reporting on all 11 or nothing at all, we provide countries with this flexibility to, to, um, to provide information between these two extremes. Okay. If all 11 indicators are available, that's, 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 extremely uh, uh, excellent situation. But if data is not available and only on few sub indicators data is available, even on one, we, 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 we encourage countries to do so because that's a very good starting point. At least they start, they, they, they get the ball rolling, okay? And um, it's, a, it's a long-term process. We will build capacities of the countries as we move on and, um, you know, uh, Hopefully, sooner or later, they will be able to report on um, on all eleven sub indicators that constitute the dashboard of SG two four one. As I mentioned earlier, uh, as part of my previous presentation, we are developing um, um, solutions around alternative data uh, uh, collection instruments. Um, this will be a practical sort of a guideline, which uh, will be or a manual, which the countries can can pick and uh, see uh, as to as to what extent their alternative data sources are are SEG241 ready this is obviously to to um, focus away not focus away but to but to broaden the horizon of SEG241 reporting instruments apart from agriculture survey to include others so that we can enhance and improve reporting. In parallel, we are continuously reaching out to countries um, uh, and um, we are providing them uh, with capacity development support in obviously in close coordination with 50 by 2030 program and the agri survey program to collect and analyze detailed farm level data for SG241 monitoring. Now, I'm not going to go through the details of this particular slide because we already covered it as part of my previous um, presentation. So as I was mentioning, you know, apart from agriculture survey, which is, which is around which the methodology is currently built, we are exploring the possibility of a uh, country using other data sources apart from agriculture survey. Some are fairly straightforward, like say, for example, secure rights to land tenure, this, this information is um, it's fairly straightforward to, to be collected from other data sources, but um, usually, you know, um, 
or other sub indicators we need to have uh, um, some practical steps uh, outlined already so that countries can collect and report data in a uniform and consistent way. So I'm not gonna, okay, let me just briefly cover this because um, this is important. In general, um, alternative data sources usage is not very easy because uh, these alternative data sources widely due to different objectives, scale of assessment, their scope and definitions. Okay, so remember, you know, what we have covered for SU241, okay? So if the survey has a different objective, if it's a household survey, you know, that is, that is used to monitor, um, let's say, for example, I'm just exemplifying um, the rural livelihoods in terms of, um, in terms of um, the commodities that, that, that are accessible to the, to, to the rural population then the objective of that survey are entirely different from the survey objective of uh, agriculture survey. So how do we make sure to use such an information in a, in a, in a, in a fruitful way, which, which, which is beneficial for SE241 data is, is, is complicated. Scale of assessment is, is another issue. Uh, in 241, we are making assessment at agriculture holding level. So keep that in mind. Scope is another important, um, um, consideration. We cover in the context of 241 both crops, livestock, and a mix of both. So surveys which are primarily focused on crops or livestock, it would be it would be you know a challenge on how to how to make sure that we um, make available the missing information on the sector which is not covered as part of the scope of that survey. Temporal resolution and periodicity of the data set, sampling issues, uh, different unit of measurement, association of the results with agricultural land area, adjusting and harmonizing different baseline across different countries, integrating data from different sources um, usually is complicated due to lack of mechanism that is needed for coordination amongst different institutions that are custodian of that particular information at the country level. So several issues uh, need 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 needs to be considered before we can before we can use alternative data sources or existing data sources. It's it's, it's not easy. Uh, these are the conditions which I covered already as part of my previous presentation. And in what cases you can use alternative data sources for reporting on SG two for one. So I'm not going to go through this. Stream of work on alternative data sources. I already mentioned we have already kick-started working on remote sensing. Um, we uh, will begin working on the other alternative data sources apart from remote sensing um, uh, fairly soon. Um, and then we will be testing and uh, performing some data analysis. We will draft guidelines and hopefully these guidelines will be available towards the end of this year. If not toward the end of this year, then uh, from beginning to mid of next uh, year, 2022. So with this, I came to the end of uh, my presentation, but before uh, opening the discussion, let me just um, tell you about the next steps. So the participants are requested to fill in the stock taking Excel sheet that was shared with you already. This will help us assess the data gaps in your agriculture statistical system vis-a-vis -vis the requirement of SGU 241. Now, many of the countries who are participants to this training participated in the earlier trainings as well. Like say, for example, I exemplified Malaysia, uh, sorry, Indonesia, Philippines, and others. So if you have already filled in the stock taking Excel sheet, we, we um, would request you to fill it in again and revise your, far, far, you know, your, uh, your, um, your data accordingly uh, within this uh, stock taking Excel sheet. This will help us um, see as to whether some improvements have been made since you know last time you got trained on the indicator. And plus, we we would like you to uh, prepare a, a two to three page action plan that details the implementation of and reporting on SG two four one. 
that is to isolate and identify the constraints that inhibit reporting on the entire dashboard currently. And what action will you take and by when for your country to be able to collect data on SG241 and report it back to FAO? So these are the couple of action points for you guys. Soon after this training, we will uh, we will send you an email, um, you know, and we will be following up with you closely on this. Usually, we we you know provide or set um, a deadline of maybe maximum two weeks for countries to report back to us on uh, on uh, on these uh, two activities because this will help this help us. Um, plan, um, you know, our capacity development efforts accordingly going forward at FAO. So this is that. I mean, Stefania, if, 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 you, if, you, if you want, we can, uh, we can invite our colleagues from Indonesia to share their experience. And then perhaps towards the very end, we then, I display the very last slide and uh, we open for discussion. Perfect. So, yes, since also we don't have any questions. So. Let's move forward. So Statistics Indonesia will now share their experience um, in the data collection process, uh, sampling, issues in compiling the indicators and their interpretations, the overall challenges, challenges, the lesson learned and the way forward. So let me officially thank Statistics Indonesia and Mr. Kadir for having accepted to present and share in this training their experience. This is precious uh, uh, for sure for all listening countries. So Indonesia has benefited last year of the virtual training, as Aswanja said, and this year they wanted to bring the experience here to demonstrate their work and get also feedback and suggestion from all of you. So Mr. Kadir, you have the floor. You can share your presentation. Okay, we can see your uh, presentation, but you need to unmute yourself. You had the bottom, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you for the floor, Stefania. Thank you. For, yeah. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone, Indonesian time. Uh, I will try to be short, yeah. Um, I would like to thank uh, FEO, particularly Tomar, yeah, for opportunity given to us to share our experience in implementing AGRIS in Indonesia. Uh, we use AGRIS as a data collection instrument or tool for two, two for one SDG indicator in Indonesia and we are going to share with you our experience in implementing the survey, the pilot of the survey, and also the computation of the uh, indicator. This is the outline of our presentation. We, I will uh, make a start with explanation about uh, the reason why we choose AGRIS as a uh, data collection tools for uh, uh, computing uh, two for one SDG indicators. And then I will uh, explain a little bit more detail about the pilot project covering the methodology, data collection, dissemination, and advocacy that we that we get from MEFEO and also some issue on computation and limitation in, in computing two for one SDG indicators. And then I will present some lesson learned uh, from our experience last year in implementing the pilot project and I will close my presentation with uh, explaining our plan uh, for the for the future especially this year. Why we choose AGRIS? Uh, you know uh, as uh, Arbab uh, has already explained to us in uh, his presentation the computation of the uh, two for one SDG indicators uh, consisting of uh, 11 sub-indicators. It needs a wide range of data. Uh, that's why um, when using different data source for different sub-indicators is, is not possible for us, for Indonesia. 
due to the lack of good alternative data source. Actually, there are many data sources, uh, particularly collected by other uh, other institutions, government agencies, uh, other than the NSO. Yeah, uh, for example, the Ministry of, the Ministry of Agriculture also uh, produces uh, some administrative data, but the issue is with the quality of the data. You know? uh, sometimes the concept and definition. Uh, are not uh, consistent with what we have at NSO. So there is a problem with uh, data integration. That's why uh, using different source of data is not possible for us. So we need kind of uh, an integrated farm survey uh, to, uh, to provide us with uh, uh, all information needed for the computation of the indicator. And we try to follow uh, AVO uh, recommendation in, in, in that regard. Uh, as you we already know, there is uh, an agricultural integrated survey called IGRIS. So we use this survey as our vehicle, our uh, data collection tools to collect all information needed for the computation of the indicator. So we use the core module, uh, the module allows us uh, for data collection in one single year. All information needed can be collected in one single year. So uh, this is the timeline of our pilot project. We conducted the pilot project last year in 2020. Um, we start uh, with survey preparation. Actually, uh, the survey, agri survey is, is, is something new for us, you know, so all we need in the first time is just downloaded all resources from every website, the handbook, uh, questionnaire, tabulation plan, and so on. We fully adopt all of them. Yeah, we do a kind of translation in Bahasa. And then after that, when everything uh, was ready, we then uh, uh, do sampling design and also train our enumerators for the implementation. And we do that collection in September 2020, last year. Um, actually, this is, uh, this is one of the limitation of our implementation. We only covered uh, household sectors. And we use KPI for data collection, so uh, paperless. And then for data processing, uh, yeah, we do a typical data processing process. Yeah, we do data cleaning and imputation. We compute uh, uh, some SDGs indicators from base SDGs indicators that can be produced from the agris. Um, and during data processing, actually, we develop that kind of a, da a dashboard, a monitoring dashboard website. Uh, it is kind of website that we use for a monitoring purpose. So through the website, we can monitor the progress of the survey uh, from time to time. We also can monitor to some extent the quality of the data collected by our enumerators um, to check the outlier and things like that. And then after data processing, we do reporting and validation. And finally, we disseminate the result uh, last year. So the publication was already available uh, in our website, so everyone can access the, the publication. Yeah, about the methodology of the agri survey. Actually, we just tried our best to adopt to adopt uh, um, FAO recommendation in terms of methodology. Uh, however, because the limitation of our sampling frame. We use our, the result of our uh, census of agriculture conducted in 2013 as the frame, and the census only covered uh, household sectors. That's why in the statistical unit of our pilot project last year only covered household uh, uh, sector. Uh, as uh, Arbab said, we should uh, we have to. Uh, cover also non-agricultural holding, namely agricultural enterprise, agricultural holding other than agricultural households, and also agricultural enterprises. But because of the limitation, we, we didn't cover all of them. 
uh, about the activities that we cover in our pilot project uh, because uh, for the sake of the, the needs of our stakeholders we not only cover uh, food uh, crops and livestock we also cover uh, fishery uh, forestry and also and also agricultural services uh, regarding the sampling frame because we implemented a kind of multi-step multi-stage random sampling method we have uh, at least three frames uh, here the first one is a frame for selecting a district or city so uh, we, as i said before we conducted the pilot project in the three provinces and from each provinces uh, in the first uh, uh, step the first stage we, we select uh, we selected is, uh, some districts or city we use uh, kind of a probability proportional to size uh, systematic sampling you know and the size is uh, the, the, the the total number of agricultural households in each uh, districts or city the source of the frame is, uh, as I said before, the result of our agricultural census in 2013. After we select district, uh, in, uh, at each, uh, in each uh, selected district, we then select, uh, we call it census blocks in Indonesia. The census block uh, actually mean, uh, means uh, enumeration area. Yeah, enumeration area in Indonesia, we call it uh, census block. So we also have a frame for selecting census block yeah, uh, and from our uh, census of agriculture in 2013. We uh, implemented a kind of PPS and then finally from each uh, selected uh, census block or, or enumeration area, we selected uh, households uh, to be enumerated. <laughs> Uh, the, about the sample size, uh, as I said before, uh, our pilot project was conducted in three provinces, namely West Java, East Java, and West Nusa Tenggara. And the, uh, the sample size for a number of districts, we selected 21 districts from all three provinces. And then from selected districts, we selected uh, 129 census blocks and the number of households samples uh, is uh, was uh, 1290 agricultural households yeah about the level of estimation our the expected result we as i said before uh, we only can can present uh, uh, the level of estimation only up to provincial level or the three provinces, yeah. Uh, yeah, because of the limitation of the uh, design of the survey. And actually, uh, the table is our plan, actually. The table is our plan. As I said before, we just uh, adopt uh, EVA recommendation uh, in conducting agri-survey you know, for computing the uh, SDGs indicators, not only to for one actually we on we, we also can compute other farm based uh, sdgs indicators uh, and we follow uh, this schema yeah you know we combine core and uh, rotating module there are four uh, rotating module uh, namely economy module labor module production method and environment module and the last one is machine equipment and asset Actually, we just uh, follow uh, Eva recommendation in this regard, and this is, will be our plan for our uh, data collection system. So, uh, besides conducting uh, census of agriculture if, uh, every 10 years, uh, between the two censuses, we will conduct agris. We will conduct agris, uh, the, the combination of core module and uh, the rotating module. So there is no issue of the discontinuation uh, in providing the uh, two for one indicators in the future by implementing this schema. And well, regarding the tools for data collection, as I said before, 
uh, we use KB, we use KB, and at DBS Statistics Indonesia, we have, we have our own uh, KB system. We call it Integrated Air Collection System or ICS. This is uh, the display of our uh, KB system uh, uh, developed uh, to, to, for the survey. Uh, actually, uh, the application was installed in each uh, enumerator uh, device. So actually we implemented kind of, maybe you can call it bring your own device. So uh, we, de we developed the application in Android platform, so it can be can be installed in each uh, uh, enumerator device. Yeah. Uh, beside the to to beside the the KP system, we also uh, developed uh, the web monitoring system, as I said before. So uh, the KP system and the website, uh, the two uh, are connected. So. So we can uh, we can monitor from time to time uh, the progress of the survey uh, uh, for each provinces, even for each uh, 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 selected district. So we also we also can monitor uh, the quality to some extent, the quality of the data collected by our enumerators from this uh, uh, from this website, just for the sake of. Uh, early warning system and things like that. Yeah, the two basically uh, are, are connected. So when uh, our enumerators uh, feed in all information uh, collected from the, the, from the household, we can see the progress uh, uh, on the website. About the data collection, advocacy and dissemination, yeah. Yeah, data collection, uh, as I said before, we use uh, KP, so bring your own device, uh, uh, data collection tools, and an average, um, uh, actually the enumeration process uh, took quite long uh, for, uh, for you that uh, already had experience with Agris, I think is already knew that the question of the survey is quite complex. That's why uh, it uh, needs uh, a long time to complete one questionnaire. Based on our experience, it took about uh, three hours to complete one questionnaire. And we do the survey, we did the survey uh, in two months, uh, six, 60 days uh, period, yeah, from September to October, 2020. So, our uh, each of a field enumerator assigned for two uh, for, from uh, for two until up to three enumeration area of census plot. <clears throat> About the organization of our data collection, I think uh, this is a, a typical of uh, a organization in, in data collection or or a survey. Uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, fewer and admin administrator uh, at head office headquarters in, in Jakarta, down to provincial office. Uh, besides, we have uh, fever and administrator. We also have a supervisor, and then down to district office, uh, we have supervisor or fewer and administrators also administrator also. And yeah, and. In the last front, we we have a field officer. So the the enumeration process uh, was conducted uh, by a team. So uh, a team uh, of enumerators or field enumeration con consisted of one field supervisor and one field supervisor supervised uh, three enumerators. And but when it comes to advocacy, uh, through this opportunity, we would like to thanks very much to Aveo uh, for all support and uh, technical assistance that uh, have uh, given to us. All of them are very useful for us in implementing the surface and also in, in uh, computing some SDGs indicators, farm-based SDGs indicators, including uh, two for one uh, SDGs indicators. Just to mention, yeah, last year as uh, 
uh, Mr. Arbab said, we, we were one of the participants of the training and the training, we found the training was very beneficial for us yeah, in, in computing uh, two for one SDGs indicators. Last year also we have, uh, uh, we had uh, some technical assistance from EVO headquarters, uh, Flavio and team. They give, uh, they give us uh, some training on um, technical issue, budgeting, sampling uh, uh, strategy and so on uh, regarding the implementation of the agris. We also uh, receive technical assistance from EVO RAP, National Asia Pacific or and college. From them, we, we had a training on SDG indicator 5A1 and also training on WCA for our, for the implementation of our agricultural census in 2023. Uh, as I said before, we already published, we disseminate the result of our pilot project. Uh, in this, on the screen, uh, you are seeing uh, the, the first publication. We plan to have two publications. The first one uh, was already disseminated, this one. Uh, the publication uh, 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 present the result of uh, our analysis computation on uh, the fund-based uh, SDGs indicators that resulted uh, used from the, the, the the implementation of the pilot project, including uh, the two for one SDG indicator. So the publication is already available in, in our website. So for the second publication, maybe uh, in the next two or three months will be ready. Yeah, this is the result uh, for uh, S, uh, two for one SDG indicators that we produced from our pilot project. So as you can see, um, uh, around almost 90% of agricultural land uses in the three provinces falls under the standard of productive management uh, to ensure sustainable agriculture. So I think this actually the result was quite shock for us because maybe this is a strong indication that our agricultural practice is not sustainable. Adir, we'll, I think we lost yeah. you. Hello, Kadir. Okay, I think he had some connectivity problems because it's not online anymore. Yeah, uh, I think so. They will rejoin soon. Yes, for sure. Uh, in the meantime, if any country has some question, please do not hesitate to write. So as soon as Mr. Kadir uh, finished with the presentation, we can ask him. Yeah, Kadir is back, I think. Kadir, are you able to hear me? You are muted. Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please you share. Are, uh, sorry uh, for the. Yeah. yeah, please continue. Share your presentation and go ahead. Yeah, but I didn't know the last 
where, where are the last slide I presented? <laughs> Maybe you can. You, you were help. you were presenting that almost ninety percent of your um, of the results oh, yeah. on the sustainability. Yeah. What is the status yeah. of two four one? Yeah, this one before this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me share again the, the screen. Sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah, this is the result of for uh, two for one SDG indicators that we produce from the implementation of our pilot project. Yeah, around almost ninety percent of our agricultural land uses in the three provinces falls under the standard of productive management to ensure sustainable ag agriculture. Yeah, actually this result was quite shocking for us because this is a strong indication. Maybe this is a strong indication that our agricultural practice in Indonesia is not sustainable, but uh, I think we, we should uh, be careful in, in, inter in interpreting the result. Actually the challenge for us is how to communicate the result to our uh, stakeholders, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, this is a, a more detailed uh, result uh, breakdown for each sub indicators, the uh, 11 sub indicators, as you can see on the screen, the, the unsustainability of our agricultural practice or agricultural land use uh, is uh, associated with uh, the land productivity yeah, because uh, almost 90% of land productivity uh, can be considered uh, not sustainable based, based on our uh, pilot project in the three provinces. Uh, moving to issue of computation, maybe for this, uh, we need kind of clarification from Mr. Arbab. Uh, we have some issue regarding the computation. The first one related to sub indicator six, fertilizer pollution risk, yeah. Uh, in our case, there were farms that take only one step in reducing environmental risk. And based on that, we classified them into as an sustainable group. Uh, my colleague, my colleague told me that it seems that we did a misclassification in this, in this case. Maybe Arbab can clarify about this. And also we have uh, issue for sub indicator seven biodiversity. Uh, there, there were farms that take only also one step in reducing health and environmental risk or health only and environmental only. We classify them into acceptable group. Yeah, and for the, the last one for sub indicator nine, which rate in agriculture uh, instead of using uh, the national minimum wage rate or agricultural sector wage rate as a comparison, we use uh, regional provincial minimum wage, uh, which, which is determined by law by the government. About the limitation, we, we have uh, some limitation in our implementation of the AGRIS last year. Uh, the, uh, the first one, we found that Measuring the environmental impacts of agriculture through farmers declaration for memory recalling is uh, quite challenging. We found that in general, farmers can cannot uh, assess quantifically, analyze quantifically uh, 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 soil content or water quality. Uh, it, our, in, in our view, it implies moving from measuring outcomes or impacts to assessing trends in farming practice based on farmers' memory recalling. And as I said, as I said before, the main limitation of our implementation is we didn't cover uh, non-household sector. We also covered household sector. Uh, given a significant portion of agricultural land managed by the non-household sector in the three provinces, uh, the indicator that we produce may be less representative in measuring agricultural sustainability in all these dimensions. And uh, about the lesson learned, um, 
from the implementation in the implementation last year actually we faced uh, some key challenges uh, ranging from budgeting and so on in the in terms of uh, budgeting uh, um, budget constraint is, is is a big issue for us so as the consequences uh, our field enumerators uh, receive uh, inadequate payment and also the key challenge also about the questionnaire, because as you know, as as as, as uh, already mentioned, that the uh, content of Agri's questionnaire is quite complex, and there are many pages, there are many questions that should be asked uh, to uh, uh, respondent, and this condition creates a kind of a respondent burden during the enumeration, as I said before, on average. It took uh, about uh, three hours just to complete one questionnaire in average, on average. Uh, the, the challenge about technology, our KP system also had some technical issues, um, especially regarding the, uh, the internet connection, poor internet connection in some areas. And also we found that uh, gadget literacy uh, was a very important issue. Uh, in, in conducting innovation. Uh, the pandemic, of course, uh, um, because of the, the pandemic, uh, some areas, some district uh, uh, impose uh, restriction of movement, uh, lockdown, things like that. So um, in many parts, face-to-face uh, -face interview uh, could not be uh, conducted. And also uh, the challenge uh, related to concept and definition. Uh, we found that some concept and their definition, as I said before, we just fully adopted uh, the manual, the questionnaire from AVO. We just downloaded uh, the, all the materials from AVO website and then do translation into Bahasa. And we found that uh, some concept and definition are not uh, are not uh, are not common yeah, for the Indonesian context. So our sometimes our enumerators had uh, some difficulties in understanding the the uh, the, the, the 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 objective or, or the the question on the questionnaires regarding the methodology. Uh, sampling designs uh, had limitation in uh, depicting uh, the the, far, uh, the the in, in capturing uh, the the picture of uh, each subsector because we only uh, we only build a uh, um, sampling design to estimate at a uh, provincial level we we didn't design the the methodology for estimating uh, uh, a characteristic for each uh, subsector so several essential commodities were unselected as adequate samples. So based on those uh, key challenges that we faced last year, uh, we, 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 ha we have uh, some lesson learned. The, the first one uh, regarding budgeting. So we, we conclude that an appropriate payment for enumerator should be required based on the number of questionnaires completed. And in terms of questionnaire, we conclude that there is a strong need for a simplification and also customization based on country specific condition. Um, and then in, in terms of technology, we conclude that our KB system uh, needs uh, to be improved especially to handle when uh, uh, internet connection is not so good in some areas by so our ICS have uh, have to have the ability to temporarily preserve storage and automatically upload under good network condition all the information collected from the farmers regarding the pandemic uh, of course uh, uh, Health protocol is very important. So I, based on our experience, uh, we conclude that we have to relax, should to be relaxing with the, the time period of the survey. Sometimes we have to extend the implementation of the survey, of the survey. And then 
in terms of concept and definition, uh, we, based on our experience, we, I, we, we conclude that sometimes we need to uh, make uh, some adjustment in terms of the choice of the equation. We have to adjust with uh, the condition of the uh, of the each country, specific uh, condition of each country. And then in, in terms of methodology, so uh, I think we it, it must be developed uh, carefully uh, depending on the level of estimation that we want to that we want to present and also what uh, characteristic that we want to be captured. And the step forward. Uh, we based on our implementation that we can that we can consider as successfully so we want to scale, we want to scale up the implementation of the survey uh, this year we plan to implement the survey uh, nationwide uh, we will cover all provinces in indonesia Kadir, we can't hear you. I'm afraid he lost the connection again. Yeah, I think so. Uh, anyway, that was the last slide. So, yeah, maybe we... meantime, uh, if participants have any question, then they can, because we have other Indonesian colleague who can respond. So participant, feel free to ask uh, any question, comments, or clarifications. Or maybe also as Panjar, I don't know if you want to show. Now Kadir is back. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, let me, sorry, sorry again. Let me resume the last presentation actually. Yes. Yeah, I have only two slides. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, as I said before, we will scale up the implementation of our survey to cover nation with all provinces in Indonesia. So we we, all, we will also cover non-household uh, uh, sectors, not only uh, agricultural household sector. And the level of estimation will be uh, until up to a uh, district level. Uh, that's all from us. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention and apologies for any technical problems with the internet connection. Offer to you, Stephania. We are happy to take any question. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Kadir. This was a very uh, helpful presentation. So it seems for the moment uh, we ask, ask participants if they have questions, but we didn't get any. So let's wait a uh, few seconds. Uh, and then I think, um, we can move to the next part. So no questions for, no questions. Anyway, if they have, uh, we are still here, so you can answer later. Asfandiar, I think it's time to, to show the last uh, slide, right? To open the floor for a discussion. Yeah, certainly. But I would like to first answer a couple of questions that uh, Kadir asked. 
Yeah, sure, um, sure, and his sure. Presentation. So, Kadir, can you please display your presentation once again and go back to the slide where you had some issues? Okay, okay. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. This one, yeah. Oh. Sorry, sorry. Please wait a moment. <laughs> Yeah, here you are. So, um. so yes, on the on the very first questions that the firm that only take one step in reducing environmental risk, we classify them into unsustainable. That is correct. Okay. So uh, fewer no. than. Um, sorry. Yeah. Oh, so, so we are I correct. Was saying so that we are correct. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of fertilizer uh, usage, yes, I mean, um, that is that is fine. So if you're taking less than two measures, you will be classified as red. So one or yes. zero measure, you know, you, 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 you are classified as red, okay? okay. Uh, the biodiversity, um, is it biodiversity or is it fertilizer or is this pesticide? Because I think, you know, Sub indicator seven is pesticides, not biodiversity. Yeah, I think so. Sorry, I think so. This, this okay. would be, yeah. What's this one? Okay, so this is this is in fact the pesticide indicator, and in 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 this case, let me just elaborate further. So if the if the holding is taking you know uh, fewer than two from each category, then it will be classified as red. Okay. Um, so in your question, you were saying that um, but you know there is another condition which is which is important right the type of pesticide used first we need to establish that as to whether these farms are using moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides so based on that condition once we establish that then we then we say if the um, holding should take at least two measures each from health and environment related and in this case, yes, it will be acceptable. Oh, yeah. Okay. But if they are taking one step each, only one step in reducing health and environment related risk, um, these will be these will be classified as red. Oh, yeah, see. Okay, so here the classification okay. is wrong. In the first one, the classification was correct. In the second one, the classification oh, I... is wrong. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And let me go to the third concern. Instead of using the national minimum wage rate or agriculture, we use the regional. Yeah, that's fine. That that's even better. Okay. For the yeah, wage okay. rate in agriculture, the regional or provincial minimum wage rates is even a better benchmark rather than you know using a national level minimum wage rate. Yeah. So yeah, thank so you very that, much for your yeah. So that is absolutely fine. So instead of the one on the pesticides, uh, where you um, you know the classifications needs to be corrected, it should be moved to mm. red rather than yellow. Rest, you know, uh, the for sub indicator six and nine, um, you know, it's 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 fine. The what you what you have what you have done. Okay. Yeah, thank you very point. much for your explanation. Yeah. Thank you, Spanja. I think it's time to, to close. So almost all of, all of you have evaluated the, the training, but still few 
people are missing. So this is the time to finish the evaluation if you want. And uh, maybe we can all switch on the, the camera in the meantime. I'm sorry for the ones that I was not able to, to promote as, uh, as panelists. I imagine uh, it's not possible to, to, to switch on the camera. I apologize. So, Tomar, while I close, maybe you want to, to, to take the, the picture. So, um, we have a, a souvenir. <laughs> so, let me say it's time to close uh, officially this third round of virtual training on SDG 241. I would like to thank officially Asvan Yar on behalf of all the participants. We have got many messages that you have carried out uh, a training in a perfect way. And thanks to the FAO local offices and to the regional offices in Bangkok, especially Tomar, who has helped getting all the nomination and being in constant contact with the different countries to ensure the success of this training. Thanks to Statistics Indonesia for having shared the experience. And last, but maybe more importantly, thanks to all of you for having participated to this third round. We hope you have enjoyed it and that we have helped you uh, gain a clear understanding of the methodology of the SDG 241 indicator. So in the end, in these extraordinary circumstances uh, with the pandemic, uh, we managed to train almost 100 participants and these are going to be added to already 300 trained uh, in the first rounds uh, of crystal training carried out in 2020, and also about 100 trained last month for the African region. So this is for sure something that uh, would not have been uh, possible to achieve with an in-person training. Uh, please remember that you are more than welcome to contact us anytime through our SDG email account. And as promised, we will be sending the certificate of attendance or to all participants that were connected for the four days. We, we will be also sharing the recordings so that you can go through uh, the videos anytime you want. We will be sharing the presentations and also the final report of the training. So this will not be done immediately, of course, but as soon as it's ready, everything ready, we will be sharing um, the report and the certificates probably will go uh, in a while, will come in a while. So I leave the floor to Aspandia for the last words and, uh, and then I wish you uh, a rest uh, of your day and good night and good evening and good morning. So thank you. Thank you, Stefania, for as usual, you were excellent in terms of moderating and facilitating this session and in your presentation. So thank you very much as always. Thank you, Tomar, for making yourself available and for all the coordination that you carried out behind the scenes to make this workshop uh, successful. Uh, my thanks to Sangeeta as well, who showed willingness in allowing uh, you know, her team members to work with us jointly in making this, uh, this uh, uh, training uh, session successful. Thank you to Benjamin as well, I mean, for your very nice, uh, you know, and uh, pertinent uh, points and remarks and updates about uh, Cambodia. So thank you very much for that. We will be in touch. Thank you to all other FAO colleagues who are, who are participant to this training and haven't uh, uh, identified themselves. So thank you very much for all your support um, and your presence. And especially thanks to the the country's participants um, and, and our esteemed colleagues from National Statistical Offices and Minister of Agriculture, um, uh, without whom this training won't be possible. So this training was originated based on your request and um, uh, your presence means a lot to us. So um, mind you, we have reached towards the end of this training, but this is just the beginning of a new relationship. So uh, we have uh, showed you, um, you know, uh, all the basic stuff, the elementary stuff that you need to know about SCG 241. And we want to build on this relationship. So we just opened the door to you. And uh, we, uh, you know, it's not that we, with this training, we are going to wind up and, 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 and close our windows and close our doors and, 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 
uh, no, we, we want to engage with you more rigorously. We want to engage you, with you more um, uh, intensively to help you uh, implement, you know, frameworks that matters for, for your own policy making. Um, obviously, the basic, um, you know, objective or the ultimate objective of Agenda 2030 is to leave no one behind. And uh, leaving no one behind, the, 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 the basic objective uh, for us having this training is not to promote international reporting on SDGs. That's, that is a secondary objective. The primary objective is for us to support you in making better decisions and policies so that you can improve your agriculture statistical system that in turn will help you improve your policies and decisions uh, through which we can we can then um, you know um, achieve the ultimate objective of uh, of uh, eliminating malnutrition and hunger and equitable distribution of food um, across uh, across uh, across countries and regions and uh, and globally so thank you very much, all of you, for your patience and your active participation. Please don't hesitate to write to us. We have provided you with our email addresses. Um, all are with you. And, uh, you know, you can, you can always call us, write to us, and uh, talk to us. And we will be very happy to accommodate your requests, uh, you know, on priority basis as and when it arises. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. Tom, I don't know if you want to say a few words as well. Yeah, just uh, I want to thank everybody and particularly for Indonesia uh, for presentation, Kadir and team and Pak Kadarmanto, as well as FAO Indonesia office colleague for support, Cambodia, Thailand colleague. So uh, we will keep in touch. So feel free to reach us. We know each other very well. So thank you. Take care and set time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.